we have the honor of being with Christina Mittermeier today, and uh, and hopefully this will be a conversation that will connect us to many, many topics and, and, and many ways in which we depend, rely, and, and hopefully uh, will personally connect to the ocean. Cristina, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Gracias, Gonzalo. It's such a pleasure to be here and such an honor to meet you. Muchísimo gusto. Un gusto para mí también. It's been said by the, let's say, the general climate um, process. One of the pillars of the Marrakesh Partnership is oceans. And, and, and we had this meeting to speak about climate action around ocean. And our leader, Ignaz, uh, said one thing that resonated so much uh, with Nigel and myself. It's about the ocean being perceived as a main victim of the climate crisis. And we need to put also in the center of the solution. So moving from being a relevant victim, but also now as a relevant part of the potential solution. So I would like to know how those two elements, those two main words, like the, the ocean as a victim and the ocean as a solution resonates with you and connects to the amazing work that, uh, that you've done and bringing also your particular art uh, to hopefully be part of the solution. I, I, I love the, the way that this conversation is beginning because if I invite you to close your eyes for a minute and think about our planet, what do you see? You see a little blue marble floating in the big universe. And the reason it's blue is because it's covered in ocean. And these, this ocean, this salt water is not just water. It's a living broth. It's alive. And you can find a microscopic rainforest if you look with a microscope, but you can also find the largest animals on our planet. And it is so big. And it's such a dominant ecosystem on our planet that of course, it's obvious that it is the most important ecosystem on the planet. It is the ecosystem that generates the most oxygen, that sequesters the most carbon. It is the ecosystem that moderates the temperature and that provides the rain, precipitation, the currents, the wind. It is so big and so important that I, I think we've overlooked it a little bit. But I was listening, um, I want to tell you two stories. I was, I was listening to a podcast the other day and they were talking about how Elon Musk is uh, giving a billion dollars to anybody who can build a machine that sequesters carbon from the atmosphere. And last week I was diving in the Bahamas and we did a drift dive, you know, so the current takes you and you feel like Superman, like you're flying. And I was flying over this beautiful seagrass bed and it just went on and on and on. And as the current has taken me, I see an octopus, I see a sea turtle, I see, you know, sharks in the distance. And I'm looking at the seagrass and I'm thinking, this is the machine. This is the machine that absorbs the most carbon in the atmosphere. So much so that without seagrass, our planet would simply not have an, an atmosphere. So I would like to say to Elon Musk, we already have the machine. We need the billion dollars. <laughs> you don't have to build it. You just have to protect it and restore it. That's right. And, and the ocean, yes, it is a, it's a victim because we have abused it and we have taken too much and we have dumped too much into it. But we also have to recast it in the role of the solution because it is the solution. And all we have to do is protect it. Maravilla. Thanks so much for that, uh, for that uh, personal connection and definitely a global connection to how much we are expecting and, and how much of our hope is in the hands of people like Elon Musk and their billion dollars. And of course, we need to mobilize that capacity and those efforts but at the same time recognize that the, so much of what we need has been here for millions of, uh, of years, right? I've learned in the last year uh, or so that whales are an, an incredible machine of sequestering carbon and bringing it back to, uh, to the depth of the ocean. And, and, and I can imagine how much of that has been uh, a, a learning process in the last, whatever, decades? Yeah. On how much of that has been there for centuries? I don't know. 
Yeah, I think um, I think we we all be, we humans, you know, we love technology and we love the idea of these machines. And it is again Elon Musk that talks about you know taking humanity to Mars. And you know, I'm I'm not sh- about sure about you. You know, I don't want to go to Mars. I kind of no, like it neither. here. <laughs> I, I know, I, yeah. Look at it. I don't. I don't think that the red one seems to me like an, a nice one. No, I know. And I don't know how many of us would fit in his flying machine that would take us to Mars. But imagine that you and I have a ticket and that you and I are going to Mars. And so we would board this spaceship that's taking us for several years on this big journey across the universe to Mars. The first thing we would receive would be an incredible briefing of how everything works. Your entire life support system is in this little machine. So you would need to know where the water comes from, you know, how to control the temperature, where food comes from, how do we deal with waste? Of course, you're an expert in that Mm -hmm. and all of these things. And here we are, Gonzalo, traveling in our tiny little machine, planet Earth. It has everything we need, everything we will ever have and own and desire and dream of is in this blue marble that we're traveling on. And we know nothing about it, nothing. We are discovering new species in the ocean that we didn't know were there. We are discovering how some of the very basic foundations of the ecosystem work. And even as we don't know so much, we're still destroying it. And so it's kind of silly, right, to start taking nuts and bolts out of our flying machine <laughs> that needs to carry us. Yeah, I, I, I indeed, I, I was invited some years ago by William McDonough, what we call like the father of the circular economy, to a conversation exactly about that, uh, about how, how, like, what, what are the best conditions for setting a spaceship or uh, a space uh, station in Mars. And one of the things that is was incredible is that we have all the technology to live in Mars sustainably, and we're failing to do the same thing in this amazing planet. So I, I'm encouraging um, and, 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 and somehow willing to know uh, more about what, what are those uh, elements that arises when you explore the depth of the ocean, both in the level of damage that we have created and which and how much of the learnings and how much of the improvement that should be uh, delivered in this amazing planet are also coming from the ocean how much of the scientific knowledge that has improved probably in the in the in the last years uh, are things that we should be implementing dramatically fast uh, of course as you know i'm coming a lot from the circular economy topic mm-hmm. and that means waste and mm-hmm. how much of the waste is being dumped to the ocean being one of the things that is showing us elements that and, and, and concepts that we need to improve dramatically and at the same on the same time uh, how much of the learnings from seaweed and 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 characteristics of the oceans are allowing us to improve I love um, a, a scientific paper that was published last year by a group of, uh, of some of my favorite ocean scientists led by Dr. Carlos Duarte from uh, the University of Abu Dhabi. And the first time I saw the paper, I, I was really impacted by the title. It is called Restoring Marine Life. And then the tagline says, how do we restore health and abundance to the oceans by 2050? And I, I really love that hopeful uh, aspiration because you know, the Reverend Martin Luther King didn't start his speech by saying, I have a nightmare. He told us what the dream was. And, and for me, this aspirational idea that we can actually revert the ocean to a state where it was like a hundred years ago, when there were enormous schools of fish, when there were more whales than you could count, where you could swim in the beach and not encounter trash pollution. To me, that's really aspirational. And so what Duarte and his colleagues talked about is um, six wedges, six areas of action that we need to tackle. And we don't have the luxury, Gonzalo, of tackling one or two. We have to tackle them all and we have to do it at the same time. And these are super simple. We have to protect more of the ocean. We have to protect species. We have to rethink fisheries and how do we exploit fish as commodities. We have to stop the flow of pollution into the ocean. We have to restore some of the ecosystems that we have degraded like coral reefs and mangroves. 
And the most important is we have to recast the ocean as a solution to climate change, not as a victim. And if we do those six things, guess what? By 2050, your children, my children might enjoy the type of beaches that you and I grew up in. So I, I think that's amazingly hopeful. And I think it's actually kind of simple. So, <laughs> I mean, absolutely. And, and indeed, uh, it's great you brought Carlos to the conversation. I had the privilege of getting to know Carlos, also invited by William McDonough. So great to have him also with us in this conversation. And, and you, you might know, uh, Christina, that our work as, as climate champions with Niger is to mobilize the non-party stakeholders. One of the tensions that we oftenly confront when it comes to ocean is that oceans at the end is, uh, I mean, belongs to everyone. Mm -hmm. And also when it comes to the role of protecting, the role of restoring, it's much more related to the national governments. And it, it seems to be hard to realize what is the particular connection when it comes to subnational government cities or business mm -hmm. sector or the financial institution. So I would like to know from you that have been exploring the ocean, could you try to refer to what are the types of impacts that you can imagine immediately when it comes to not only the, the negative side, right? The, the negative mm -hmm. impact of those type of actors, but also can you imagine or, or, or share with us some of the best experiences that you have seen when it comes to businesses, cities or investors or civil society doing the right thing? Yeah. I would love to, I love this question, by the way, thank you. I'd like to start by talking about this idea of cognitive blindness. You know, it's like um, like when you're in a, in a theater and somebody's having a heart attack, but nobody moves because we are all kind of like paralyzed. I, I feel like we're experiencing something similar when it comes to the climate catastrophe. And I, I looked at this question for a long time, Gonzalo, thinking, you know, I might the only person who cares? Um, am I the only person who's willing to take action, to stand up, to do whatever I can? And it's been incredibly rewarding and inspirational to find others like you who are willing to leave it all, you know, to put our entire lives in the service of humanity. But I discovered something really interesting. For the last 30 years, we've been talking about the degradation of the ocean, but we haven't really communicated this to the public. You know, it really is happening at the policy level in the UN and these big conferences. But to the regular citizen, we haven't given them an opportunity to learn and understand the vital role that the ocean plays in our, di in our daily lives and how they can have a huge impact every day. So I have made that my life's mission. And I discovered that when we lead the conversation with science, when we talk to people about degrees and graphs and scientific data, most people don't speak that language. So they reject it. Nobody likes to feel stupid or incompetent. But when you show somebody a photograph or a video, you know, we all feel competent. We all are very good at stories and we're all very good at visual um, interpretation. So people actually feel like they are invited into the conversation, that they can ask questions, that they want to know more. And so I started building, you know, a very large social media following just by sharing little stories with people. And then I made a massive discovery, Gonzalo. In 2017, we published the video of a polar bear that was starving in the Arctic, and it went viral. And people were really upset, you know, and I, I couldn't understand why. And then I realized that, when you show people something that's very disturbing and depressing, but you don't give them an opportunity to take action, it's worse. So I came to the realization that we, first of all, need to involve the everyday citizen in learning and knowing and becoming ocean citizens. We need to lower the price of entry. This is for everybody. And then we need to build technology platforms and tools that allow every citizen to be part of it. And so that's what I've been doing creating uh, technology tools that allow people to take digital actions wherever they are to help the ocean and the ocean heroes protecting the ecosystems. Because to answer your question, and sorry that I rambled it around so no, long. It's, it's beautiful that you brought, I mean, we, we will go back to art and photograph definitely, but... Uh... At the end of the day, we live in democracies and we elect our officials and those officials are here to serve the interest of the people. But the only the only way that they can know what the people want is that the people know and are informed. And so 
teaching and understanding and making making sure everybody is an ocean citizen and that we all elect people who know what we want, what we expect from our climate, from our ecosystem, from our ocean, I think is a, a great way to start. Absolutely. Um, I, 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 I mean, that resonates a lot with things that with, with Nigel, we're trying to uh, promote and connect very concretely through art, through not only um, visual and elements like uh, a photograph or a painting uh, or a documentary, but also through the, a, the capacity of a mixture between technology and innovation. What other experience that also, once, and, and, and share please your, your emotion. Like when you were taking that photograph, what, what came to your mind on the capacity of that photograph on mobilizing a certain global leader or a certain mm -hmm. industry, or were you thinking about kids or adults? Like, I, I would like to know about that. What happens to you? What's, what's in that moment between you and the camera? Yes, I love, um, I love photography because uh, I always feel like, uh, like I'm, I'm uh, like osmosis. I'm a, I'm, I'm a permeable membrane that is allowing a conversation to happen between the subject, the thing that I'm photographing and the people that are viewing the photograph. And my job is just to facilitate that conversation that otherwise would not happen. And I, I love making photographs that stop people in their tracks and make us think. Uh, iconic images, you know. If I say to you, Gonzalo, Che Guevara, I, I know the photograph that's coming to your head. Immediately. If I say, Absolutely. if I say napalm, Vietnam, you know, there, you, the picture of that girl running right. down. I mean, so photographs have that ability of, um, of internalizing into our subconscious in a way that makes us remember. And I try to make pictures like that. But I also think that people love the stories behind the photographs. What did it feel like, you know, to, to swim with an orca, to have a male orca, you know, come close to you and then it gives you a little bit of a buff, it scares you a little bit and you can almost see how it's giggling because it scared you. And then it makes a U-turn and comes right back, you know, and you can see it's enormous fins, it's big dorsal, it's just it's a massive animal. And it's trying to understand you and it's it's clicking, it's you can feel it in your body. And you know all I could do? I started singing in my snorkel, thinking, you know, I... <laughs> If I was visited by aliens, you know, I would sing so that they know that I don't mean any harm. <laughs> and funnily enough, I started singing New York, New York, which is really okay. funny. Anyway, um, I wanted to, when we were working for National Geographic, uh, we were always told by the editors that it was not okay for the photographer to insert himself or herself into the photograph. Because I'm curious about what it's like to take the photographs, I wanted to share those stories. And so we built only one, which is a technology platform, and every piece of content shares those stories. It, you know, what does it feel like? Uh, what was happening? But then it gives you an opportunity to take an action, whether it is to tweet to a prime minister or to sign a petition or to donate to empower the work of local leaders, whatever it is. I think it's that feeling in people that they're making a positive contribution that together as a massive global community, we can actually mobilize for climate. I think that's the key. You know, if we feel like, like, like it's despair and desperation and depression and there's nothing I can do, then you're paralyzed. So finding ways for people to join hands and act together. Brilliant. And, and once you have that image, is it a picture or a documentary, a video? Then, um, like probably 20, 30 years ago, it was all about uh, the mechanism would be a newspaper, a magazine, or of course, m maybe an exposition somewhere. Now we have some other ways to bring that, not, not only the, the image itself, but the magic that is in there, all the content, Mm -hmm. what, what's the best technological tool that you've been thinking about on, on, on the best possible way to bring all that content into where it's needed? Whether it's, again, um, a, a global leader, a politician or a company or, 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 or to massify it to the population. 
I love this question. Man, you're good at this, Gonzalo. Um, imagine this. When I was working with National Geographic, I used to think, we all used to think that it was the largest megaphone on the planet. You know, if you're published in that magazine, you have arrived. You know, you're reaching a lot of people. If you get the cover, then you, you're done. But I realized over time that it only works if you're working with champions on the ground that are willing to take that magazine and, and use it as a banner. So Paul and I, Paul Nicklin, my partner and I, we left National Geographic to start our own distribution channel because we wanted to control the story and we wanted to be the champions. And it was really fun, you know, in the first two or three years when social media first came out, Instagram came out, started telling these stories, publishing these pictures, and people liked it. You know, we started getting followers and shares and likes, and that felt really good. When we published that picture of the polar bear, we discovered that people really need, to, they want to participate. Gonzalo, people are tired of being asked to do the least they can do. We all want to do more. And so we set out to build a technology platform that allowed every piece of content to be tied to an action that people anywhere can take. Today, there's many actions and there's many channels. We pride ourselves in saying that we have one of the largest social media following for ocean conservation groups. We only have 15 million people. That's not enough. We need many more. We need billions of people to be excited and engaged and inspired and hopeful. And so that's the goal, right? I mean, can we use um, documentaries? Can we use uh, podcasts? Can we use stories like this one? I think we need to do it all. And I think we need a lot of people telling stories, a lot of people doing art uh, to inspire and change culture. Brilliant. Thank you for that. And you, I totally agree on you. Uh, what, what, well, going back to, to the challenges that the oceans face uh, due to your experience, due to what you are capturing, uh, what's that latest challenge that our oceans are facing and what does the next generation of ocean conservationists need to do in order to overcome them? Yeah, I think the biggest, the biggest challenge that the ocean faces is that we know so little about it. And we are attacking it on so many fronts, you know, it's death by a million wounds. So we, we already have collapsed over 80% of the big fisheries. We have taken too much out. We have failed to understand that the animals that we're capturing are not limitless, that their populations are collapsing and that every time you take a piece of the puzzle out of the food chain, something else crumbles. So I am really worried about uh, the continued efforts of industrial fisheries. I think in the interest of supporting climate change resiliency, we should ban industrial fishing. That is not the same as banning artisanal fishing. People in coastal communities need to survive. And how good would it be, Gonzalo, if we all knew who caught our fish on our plate? And if we knew that that's a family business that supports a local economy. The second thing is um, we really are altering the chemistry of our planet, the, the balance of gases. And the ocean is generous. The ocean is good. It plays a huge role in mitigating the amount of gas in the atmosphere. It absorbs so much of it, but it's already becoming very acidic uh, because carbon dioxide, when you know enters the ocean, it becomes an acid. And so it's difficult to quantify. I think even if you tasted salt water, you would not be able to tell. So we don't know what the effect of acidification is having as a whole. Most concerning to me is uh, the things that are irreversible, right? I, I'm sure you know that we have issues that are possibly solved with technology, with circular economy thinking. There are other issues like the loss of biodiversity, the loss of sea ice that are irreversible. Once we lose them, we will never get them back. So the loss of polar ice is very worrisome. Uh, I like to tell people, you know, that this is the air conditioning of our planet and every year we have less and less and less. And so it's not, it's not that polar bears are going to go extinct when the sea ice disappears, it's that it's really going to affect currents, fisheries, uh, you know, the, the jet stream, the, the, big, the big rivers of air that circulate around our planet. So I worry about those big things that are difficult to understand and difficult to quantify, but I am an optimist. And I like to think that humanity 
we have this ingenuity and we have this ability to turn things around. And I, I want to think that it's, it's not just you, it's not just me. You know, we have an army of people who care and who are giving it their everything every day. So I'm hopeful. And, and great to, to take the, the, the hope uh, and connect it to the level of uh, damage that we have created. Is there a narrative, uh, according to your experience, uh, related to the coral reefs? Because we know that part of the damage is very hardly reflected on how much we're losing that yeah. majesty that is uh, reflected in, on the coral reef. And at the same time, I, I've, I've learned or, or seen and read that there is some capacity of restoring that. What's yes. your experience on that? I was in, um, in the small country of Timor-Leste last year. And Timor-Leste was at war for 25 years, so they never really developed a fishing fleet. And so therefore their coral reefs are intact. And dropping in the water in, in, in those coral reefs was like, like going into a time machine. You know, it's just so amazing to, to descend into a reef that has all its beautiful, pristine corals and the fish are alive and everything is there. And there's not many reefs that we see around the world like that. We've already lost 50% of the reefs. And, you know, people say to me, oh, I don't really care for diving or snorkeling. So who cares if we lose the, well, coral reefs are very important. Um, not just because they're the nursery and sanctuary for so many species that humans need, but also because they really create a barrier that shelters the coast from the fury of hurricanes and storms. Even if that wasn't true, we should protect them and love them just because they're beautiful and because they're a critical part of our planet. So the good news is that um, we're learning that some, re some reefs, some corals are more resilient to higher temperatures, to higher acidification than others. And there's great science emerging. People that are uh, like Dr. David Vaughn, you know, he's figured out how to grow corals 10 times faster. And so now, uh, Sea Legacy, we're helping to mobilize a huge number of people to help us replant corals. And the, the goal is to plant a million corals. So we're going to start in the Bahamas and we're going to try to rebuild those corals. We're going to tell people how the story goes, you know, how it works. And then we want to do it elsewhere. And I, I think, Gonzalo, that as we restore coral reefs, abundance will come back. The fish will come back. And that drives tourism dollars. That drives fisheries dollars, you know, it's good for the ocean, it's good for us. Brilliant. Well, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the things that, um, and, and thinking about coral reefs, and, and this is a conversation that I've had, one of the person, the, the, the person that I, I follow a lot and, and, and respect a lot in this topic is Sylvia Earle, and then uh, people like, like Max Bello that have been working with her for a long time have taught me uh, most of what I've, I've, I know about uh, the ocean. And, and when it comes to our role with Nigel, uh, the connection with our work with ocean normally is about, of course, fishing, it's about uh, shipping, it's about energy. But very few times I've seen a concrete connection with tourism. And I think that there, is, there should be a very important opportunity while we can bring all of our efforts on sustainable sustainability on economic activities what all of us would love to know i mean have an experience and know and learn much more about that diversity and beauty of the oceans while having a, a nice moment on tourism so what what, what are the the, the the lines that you can reflect with us on, around tourism for sustainability and and climate solutions It's a, what, a, what a great thing, right? That you have something that you can build an entire economy around. And so these, this, this idea of the blue economy is something really beautiful. Is how do we maintain our living resources and build economic prosperity for coastal communities around it? And I think, um, Gonzalo, that it, it really goes back to our colonial thinking, you know? We have spent the last hundred years exploiting and over-exploiting and not thinking about circularity because all you have to do is observe nature to know that in nature nothing is wasted everything is a part of a circular ecosystem of services right the the fruit that falls from the tree is eaten by somebody else who then you know takes the seed elsewhere i mean everything is circular so 
I think that tourism is one of those activities that, that has a lot of potential to become very circular, where nothing is wasted and nothing is overexploited. It has to be done right. And I think um, there's many examples where it happens already. So we have to be careful. Tourism is a double-edged sword. We have a tendency to over tourists some places and destroy them, take away the magic uh, because we overutilized. But I think all of these things can be overcome. And, and I think there's great examples and telling the stories of those great examples is really important. So I think that uh, blue economies can replace exploitative economies. I think we can make more money from tourism than we can from fisheries, uh, that we can make more money from carbon credits than we can from oil. So. I just think we have to have the courage to reimagine our economic models and engines. And that takes courage. And it takes a generation of young leaders like yourself to, to say, you know what, the way that we've been doing it worked for a while, but it doesn't work anymore. And we need to have the innovation, the spirit of ambition to change it. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Uh, yes, absolutely agree. And, and, and expecting that uh, th this year with our team, uh, we will be able to promote a very concrete action track on tourism that hopefully we'll be able to connect from science to the right type of technology, meaning not only technologies like the type of energy, but also nature-based solutions. How, how by protecting the mangroves, how by protecting the biodiversity, how by restoring that nature in the coastal zones and, 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 and the in, in, like, uh, internal sea, we can develop a better way to generate the economic wealth that is, is, is good for everyone, but also, um, changing wrong incentives that we've had in the past or we are having some some kind today we can also promote what we expect to be a greener recovery system from the pandemic uh, yes what have you seen in that sense we have uh, i mean we I, I saw the documentary from david attenberg a few, a few days ago about what happened during this uh, months of of like the world stopping what have you seen in that sense? Have you been diving in different places and seeing some, some expressions of recovery from the oceans? Yes, I think uh, the ocean, of course, has a tremendous ability to recover, has a lot of resilience. So I have been lucky to spend most of the pandemic in the Bahamas. Uh, we have this boat that just happened to be <laughs> ready to go. So we decided to quarantine on a boat in the Bahamas and we've been diving every day. And we have seen extraordinary things. We have seen big populations of wildlife, sharks, dolphins, stingrays. I, the day before yesterday, I was swimming with sea turtles, you know, and I couldn't take a photograph of the sea turtle because it wanted to come so close to me that I, I, I was kind of like <laughs> I'm pushing it away. <laughs> so yes, animals need space uh, and they need um, a break from economic activity, from humans making noise, from humans creating chaos. Um, I hope that we have learned some lessons during this pandemic. I, I hope that we understand that the economic systems that have taken us to this moment are the wrong ones for the future. And that we really need to make room for different kind of thinking and have the, the courage to confront the, the special interests that want to perpetuate the, the chaotic mess that we're in, you know? Um, there's a possibility. We have a sliver, a small window of opportunity to change it all. And we have to have the courage to say, we want this change. And Christina, how much of that change that is required? We know that it will, some of that is dependent on uh, political willingness. Some of that depends on, of course, the financial mechanisms and incentives. Some, some of that, as we've expressed, depends on using the right type of technology, how much of that and how uh, we can also encourage the citizens action, right? How much of that relies on ourselves and our attitude and our behavior? 
I, I think a lot of it actually hinges on on seeing success, right? When when citizens take action and we see that something changes, we go, oh, we want to do more of that. You know, we want more change. And I actually am very grateful to the presidency of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris for taking leadership for Americans. Because the United States, for better or for worse, continues to be a leader in how we think about these things and how other countries adopt solutions. And seeing the bold, courageous um, you know, mechanisms, investments, uh, incentives, how they are tackling this issue, to me, is really inspiring. So I hope that it's going to cause a domino effect where um, the governments of other countries start taking courageous decision making as well. The citizens of other countries, we need to tackle cynicism. You know, we cannot be cynical. There is hope. We can still turn this around and there's no room for cynics. So people need to feel inspired and hopeful and energized and activated because who doesn't want to live in a beautiful planet? I want to live in a planet where there's old growth forest and where there's coral reefs and there was dolphins and whales. I think we all do. So, I mean, I think, I think we need citizens actions for political action. Christina, I think that we run out of time. I would spend like 10 years speaking to you, hopefully someday even diving with you. Uh, thanks so much, not only for this conversation. Thank you for everything that you're doing, your inspiration and your, your art is, is, is spreading the right voice and the right capacity of action. And hopefully we as, uh, as, as servants in this path will be able to uh, help promote the type of, of connection that you are providing. I want to do two things before I say goodbye, Gonzalo. I want to thank Dr. Sylvia Earle. She's been a mentor and a huge inspiration my whole life since I was in university. And I want to thank Max Bello because Max Bello, because he's the <laughs> one who had the idea for this conversation. And then I want to paint a picture in, in your mind and in the mind of everybody who's listening. And let's just for a moment imagine that we are able to turn this ship around, that we are able to embrace the culture of circular economy, that we are able to make peace with nature and to learn to respect and revere every single piece of the puzzle that makes this living planet the beautiful planet it is. And so with that beautiful image in mind, I'm going to say thank you for the opportunity, Gonzalo. Gracias por todo lo que haces and best of luck. I hope to see you in person soon. Yeah, same. Likewise. Thanks so much, Cristina, in the honor of Silvia Max. William McDonough, uh, Carlos Duarte, all of those mentors, we will continue our work together. Thanks so much. Stay well. Bye.